everyone um, today uh, we are doing our webinar on IP issues and social media and um, you should have your um, presentation material um, sent to you uh, an hour before um, the uh, the presentation started an hour ago so if you can check that you'll see all the material programs and slides um, and also we're going to have, uh, them, we're going to have them in chat. There's going to be a link in there for you to be able to access the material there as well. And also you're going to get an MCLE certificate for their presentation that should be emailed to you, uh, within 24 hours. Um, so today we have, um, uh, among our presenters, we have, Ryan Hatch and Dat. Um, Ryan is the owner of Hatch Law. Uh, he focuses on patent, copyright, trademark, and trade secret law. Uh, he represents clients in um, disputes involving software, motion picture, advertising, photography, and consumer products. He also represents patent owners and accused infringers in patent litigation and licensing um, with a wide range of technologies, including software, electronics, semiconductor health supplements and nutritional products. Uh, he has a BA in computer science and has prior experience as a software engineer um, as well. And we also have Dat Nguyen, who's an associate at the firm's IP practice and complex commercial litigation group. Um, his practice includes representing clients in federal and state courts, USPTO, arbitration, involving a variety of matters from IP and commercial disputes. He has um, an extensive experience in a wide range of technologies, including semiconductor, software, networking, telecommunications, blockchain, smart contracts, AI, uh, VR, augmented reality, audio and video encoding standards, Wi-Fi, graphics, and um, physics processing. And before um, LTL, he was a VP of uh, special projects at a smart contracts blockchain startup called Sagewise. He's um, well regarded in blockchain space and has been invited to speak at a lot of conferences. Um, so without further ado, and I myself, <laughs> I also do a lot of tech transaction and um, I work for Coleman Frost and before that I had experience in entertainment law as well doing a lot of IP for a lot of technology companies, um, entertainment, fashion companies, um, and digital space as well. So without further ado we're going to turn it over to Dat with a presentation. Thank you Darissa, um, that was a great introduction. Um, so without further ado I'll start. Um, so we're going to go over just kind of the basic uh, platforms that are currently in existence, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, LinkedIn, TikTok, Reddit, and Twitter. Uh, I'll also discuss Clubhouse, a, a new one that's just recently kind of taken um, the kind of popular uh, masses. Um, and I'll try to focus on the differences between the, these platforms and so, um, and then, you know, not get into too much detail on the platforms themselves. So. Uh, Instagram, it's probably one of my favorite platforms. Um, for the most part, uh, Instagram is an outward facing platform and generally used to post stories and share content. Um, as distinguished from other social media platforms, Instagram doesn't really facilitate as many interactions between users. Although you can still comment and message people, it's just generally not used for that feature as much as compared to other platforms. 
Um, I, I think of it as a kind of a visual version of Twitter. And so it's more for kind of self-advertising. There's a lot of the influencer culture that's kind of taken over. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, next please. Uh, all right, next is Facebook, also one of my favorites. I think Facebook came out when I was in college, uh, sophomore year, so pretty a long time ago. Um, it's the oldest platform. It's the most popular platform uh, and the age demographic in Facebook is slightly uh, older than the other platforms. Um, it's commonly used to, it, it's also the most robust of the platforms. You can do pretty much anything on it. Um, keep in touch with friends, post stories of your babies, join you know, um, social, social groups, causes, buy things, sell a car, date. I mean, it's, it's all on there. Um, and okay, next. Uh, and then Snapchat. So Snapchat is uh, one of the newer ones. And, and um, Snapchat's main use is uh, originally it was developed and used as kind of a um, auto deletion uh, messaging system. So um, its claim to fame originally was that users' messages between users would delete and not be persistent on the system. And so uh, that kind of facilitated a different type of interaction amongst users. But most recently, or more recently, um, uh, Snapchat developed the, the um, stories feature, which has since been adopted and kind of um, Im uh, imitated by many of the other platforms. Um, and that basically allowed, allowed users to post a short uh, story of their whatever content they're, they're, um, they wish to share. Um, the, the, the distinguishing feature in Snapchat is that it actually facilitates um, interactions between individuals much more than other platforms. And I don't know if you follow, anybody follows the stocks lately, but that's one of the major reasons that Snapchat's taken off uh, recently is because um, of its user engagement statistics. And one of the reasons it's able to do this is that it uses um, kind of a uh, scoring algorithm. So you can actually, you get scores or, or uh, on how much you kind of interact with other people and then in between individuals as well. And so that's kind of the unique aspect of Snapchat. But now it's kind of, you know, there's advertising and everything else on it, but I still think it's more used for communication between individuals than, than kind of publicly facing platforms like Instagram. Uh, next, please. Uh, YouTube, also one of the oldest platforms, um, but YouTube has changed a lot over the uh, over the years, and it's kind of it's now I, I consider it as a kind of a, a visual um, archive of pretty much all knowledge. If you wanted to learn anything you want about any aspect, about any uh, content uh, or any kind of current events, you can always find content on YouTube. Um, it's just basic videos. Uh, next, please. And then LinkedIn, I think we're all probably most familiar with LinkedIn. It's kind of the uh, professional social media platform. Now they've kind of, over the years, it's taken more of a, um, you know, kind of a place where people can market themselves digitally, professionally. I think especially now with COVID, a lot of people are doing more of that on LinkedIn. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, and TikTok, probably one of the newest uh, platforms. Uh, it was developed by a Chinese company um, in China. It's called Douyin. Um, it, it has very similar features to Instagram, but the distinguishing aspect about it, it is that it's not. It doesn't. It's not really about posting um, uh, images. It's about posting short uh, videos, um, and these are oftentimes music related. So there's a lot of new trends and fads that are being um, established or created on TikTok. And those are associated with um, certain snippets of sound and music and dance moves and users can um, edit. The, the other great feature about TikTok is that it allows users to easily edit video content on the platform and allow you to do it in a very versatile and dynamic way. So you can make a, just very professional looking videos just using their simple features and very quickly. So that's also one of the reasons it's taken off. The other reason is obviously the network effects of fad dance videos. And so once it, something takes off, kind of, you know, the community takes off and then you'll start seeing it in other platforms as well, like Instagram and stuff. But a lot of that originated in TikTok. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Reddit. So you probably heard of Reddit. If you haven't heard of Reddit before, you probably heard of it recently with respect to the GME and the Robinhood 
the stock trades. But uh, Reddit is really just like, like an online message board and an online forum. The uniqueness of Reddit is that it provides users with kind of a crowdsourced content review. And so you can look up any topic and you want conspiracy theory, scientific stuff, you know, stocks, anything you want. And you can see these people on online, they will collect information, post it. And then the crowd, the Reddit crowd basically upvotes or downvotes. And then they can uh, give post badges and other kind of indicias of value or, or negative value as well. And so um, if you want to learn about anything like a stock or, or a, you know, if you want to learn how to cook or something, you can go on, search a Reddit subthread, and then you can find and you can filter these reviews based on, you know, you want to look at the best reviews or you want to look at the worst posts or most controversial content. So you can really get a really good sense of what I would call like the internet crowdsource consensus of things. Um, okay, next slide, please. Uh, and then Twitter, I think Twitter's very popular. Everybody probably knows what Twitter is. It's basically an online uh, platform that is limited to 280 characters. People um, post some images, but also just kind of general statements and that's shared and it facilitates public discussions of certain things. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, so sorry, I'm just kind of transitioning through all the um, platforms. And now we're gonna discuss kind of certain IP issues related to the platforms. And one of the major, one of the big things about all these platforms is they're also, you know, both a social media place, but also a, a, a place for business and commerce. So in addition to kind of just general posts, a lot of people are uh, selling, pr uh, promoting uh, products on there. And so um, laws that would apply equally to advertising on TV and media, they also, uh, equally apply to social media platforms as well. And so some of those laws include, um, you know, 15 USC section 45 that governs unfair competition law federally, um, 16 CFR 255, that's uh, advertising considerations. Um, and so uh, next slide, please. I, I'll discuss the, um, so as a general rule with respect to influencer advertising, it's important to um, just like any other advertising, it's important to clearly and adequately disclose that the post or the material is an advertisement. Um, and adequate disclosure, we can talk about that, but requires basically that the, the post can be seen and clearly identified as an advertisement from the original post. So the user should not be required to click on anything or visit external links to, to determine that it is a post. And as it relates to a material connection, I'm sorry, uh, that relates to whether or not the influencer has received any financial gain, employment, personal relationships, basically anything that can potentially set to skew their uh, review or their opinion of the product that they're promoting. Um, next slide, please. And so we'll go into some examples here. Um, one of the cases I like to discuss is the FTC, the Team I LLC. Uh, Team I LLC sells a lot of um, health related products. A detox shakes and masks. Uh, these are probably some of the most common and uh, probably most cliche products you'll find on social media. They're easy to sell. Um, you know, they're easy to market. They're fairly cheap and also largely unregulated, more or less. They're not like drugs or food. Um, and so, in the case of the FCC uh, sued TMI for false ever for uh, uh, influencer failing to comply with advertising requirements. Um, uh, high in High profile influencers include Cardi B, um, Brittany Rainier, and some others. I don't know if people know these individuals, but uh, this is pretty, uh, these folks have about several million followers. And so one of their posts, you know, usually generates a significant amount of revenue. Um, and so essentially what happened in this case was that these products include uh, the teas, the shakes were kind of advertised as self-help weight loss products. Um, and some of them were even said to fight cancer and cure other diseases and stuff. And so that's clearly a violation of uh, advertising. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, TMI was hit with a $15.2 million judgment for both failure to adequately identify the ads. So on the left here, you'll see an example of an ad that is adequately identified. It's uh, stated, highlighted here, um, paid partnership. Whereas an example of a TMI ad on the right side where if you look carefully at the ad, it's a little, um, the print's a little small, but it basically is a self-statement uh, of Brittany 
here that says that she uses this product and it's given her great results. However, nowhere on this original post here does it indicate that the post is an advertisement. Uh, the user would have had to actually click on this more button to kind of uh, gather more information or expand the post to see that it is an advertisement. Um, and yes, yeah, so the FCC, uh, so the court found that uh, TMI was liable for both failing post uh, to adequately identify their ads, but also making false statements about the uh, efficacy of their products. Uh, next slide, please. So that's an example of advertising. So next we'll discuss a uh, trademark in social media and commerce. And so uh, trademark law generally just requires that uh, Trademark law has an uh, in-use uh, requirement for both application and infringement. And so what that means is that the trademark only has value if it is being actually being used. So you can't just register intent to use uh, or a mark that you have not used yet. That's considered or called an intent to use registration. And so you can still get some protection, but eventually you're going to have to start using the mark to actually get protection and insert it. Uh, and so an example of that is um, the Couture v. Platum case in which the trademark was uh, canceled because the applicant actually never rendered the service, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide, please. And so specifically with trademarks and social media, this often uh, is, comes, comes or manifests itself in the use of hashtags. And um, hashtags are used in nearly all of the social media platforms to basically identify or catalog what that post is about. So for example, if you're posting about a workout or fitness or something, you might do hashtag fitness, hashtag workout, or if it's a you know legal Supreme Court decision here, you can do hashtag Supreme Court decisions. And so uh, it, it's a way to identify or provide additional information, identifying the content of your post, because a lot of users will follow hashtags. And so on their feed, they will get um, updates on certain uh, posts that are associated with those hashtags. So it's kind of like an advertising aspect. Uh, where this uh, cross sections with um, trademark law is that uh, you know a lot of companies will hashtag their products using their trademarks so that people follow certain very popular trademarks like Louis Vuitton, uh, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, that also provides kind of free advertising essentially to the user of that mark because people who follow those will obviously be exposed to that those posts. And so now um, uh, people, uh, content creators need to be aware or cognizant of their use of trademarks and whether or not that trademark in, or, or of hashtags and whether or not that use of hashtags and then just other tra trademarks. So an example is from the Pub Impact, the uh, cons Bros cons Boston Consulting Group case. And in this case, the trade, um, the plaintiff Public Impact had a trademark for um, their company name Public Impact and it's related to education policy management and consulting. Um, the defendant in the case is Boston Consulting Group, also in the same industry of education and consulting, and they had started a, a social media uh, program to promote um, their account and kind of their branding and a new project that they were working on. They used the, the handle uh, for public impact as well as the hashtag public impact to promote their articles and events. And so, um, the court granted a preliminary injunction re restricting um, defendants from using the handle because it was a registered trademark and also it was in the same industry and kind of covered the same space. Uh, thank you. Next, please. Uh, next, we'll talk about the DMCA safe harbor for online providers. So a lot of these platforms are considered online providers like YouTube, um, Facebook as well. Um, and so they don't really control what their users post. And so sometimes users do post content that, you know, violates copyright and other IP issues. And so the DMCA was enacted to protect the content providers because they didn't, as so long as they adhere to some, certain of the requirements. So essentially a content provider would be shielded from liability for their users posting of potentially infringing or, or content that infringes another party's copyright, so long as they may maintain policies and protocols to remove the uh, offending content quickly um, um, after they've been notified. Uh, and so, uh, and generally speaking, I have not seen these, you know, the protection been removed. So one of the big cases here is Viacom v. YouTube, 
the dispute was that over the DC, DMCA safe harbor provision and the argument was that uh, many of YouTube's uh, users were posting a lot of content that was owned by Viacom. They have a lot of videos and, and uh, IP that they, they maintain. And so, uh, also, sorry. Uh, and so ultimately the case was remanded and YouTube was not found, uh, was found to maintain its DMCA safe harbor provision mainly because it did not actively control or know about the content and nor did it direct its users to post the content. But despite all that, um, YouTube still, uh, after this case, enacted a new policy. Um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, for its, uh, it developed a new program called Content ID. Uh, and this is just a new program to, it's not new, it's actually been out for quite a while, but it was developed after that case and used to uh, streamline the, the uh, DMCA um, uh, requirements on, on YouTube. So essentially what it does is uh, it uses uh, its AI or kind of content recognition system to identify content and then tag content with kind of like a fingerprint. So a unique copyright content can be easily identified by the machine subsequently. And so what happens here, it, it basically streamlines the process because, you know, it's like a product code or something like that. So that, you know, because there's so much content, it's really hard to kind of catalog a lot of this. And so um, using this allows content to be easily identified and then compared with offending content, content fairly quickly. And, you know, just, just to imagine the scale of kind of YouTube and kind of the, I, I can't even you know, speculate how many terabytes or, or how much information is uploaded on YouTube on a day, but that just would require a legion of, you know, users to, uh, of, of employees to review. So this system is probably the best that we're gonna get. Um, uh, next slide, please. So what happens is that uh, once once a user posts content on YouTube, it's given a content ID, and then subsequently the user can police its con their content as well. But also YouTube has a, a kind of a preliminary system that when you upload your own content, it scans your content against existing content IDs to see if there is potentially an overlap, and if that's the case, or if um, the content user or the content owner, sorry, um, identifies offending content, they can report to YouTube. And then there's an, a whole process, an appeal process, but also a process between the individuals to try to um, facilitate some sort of uh, resolution. Um, I won't go into too much detail because this is kind of, a, it's, it's a fairly um, uh, expansive process. Uh, it's fairly simple, but at the same time, it's dragged out for, uh, and then there are also intermediaries at YouTube that kind of review things and go back and forth. And so the main point of this discussion is just to let, let people know that there is a provision and there are um, protocols for dealing with the um, uh, uh, copyright content on YouTube. Um, but it's, it's, it's the best that we're gonna get. And, and Ryan will talk about that later on his slides related to some, uh, some interesting uses of uh, YouTube's content uh, program as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, we'll talk about copyright and dance move. This is kind of related to the TikTok uh, platform and, uh, and actually uh, some of how, how society or how new social media interactions, if it's a new kind of interactions within society as a whole and also uh, how it permeates throughout our culture. So one of that is kind of the TikTok dance craze that's kind of been migrated over to gaming as well. So one of the most popular games recently was um, Fortnite. And in Fortnite, um, once you know you, you, the players play as an avatar and they shoot other players, and when you win, you can do a little dance. And some of the, a lot of times these little dances are associated with popular dances that are known in media right now. And those dances are, are sometimes derived from um, popular media references like uh, Carlton, the, the Charleston here or dances from you, uh, TikTok. Um, and so there's been a recent flurry of litigations regarding, regarding this because, um, uh, because of the um, commercial success of uh, Fortnite, you know, this game made a lot of money and, um, it's sell and it's actually a free game. Despite it being a free game, it's made so much money because of uh, the, the online sales of skins, but as well as these dance moves that, that users can purchase. And so these things do generate a significant amount of revenue for the company. Um, but dance moves are not necessarily copyrightable. And so uh, 
there was a lawsuit where um, Alfonso Ribeiro, commonly known as, um, um, I forgot his name now, but it's from uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, um, the Carlton, sorry, Carlton, and it was uh, commonly referred to as a Carlton dance. And so on the right here, you'll see the dance is a fairly simple dance. I would say it's probably no more than four or five moves. Um, uh, it was actually found by the USPTO to, uh, the Copyright Office actually rejected the registration for the Carlton dance, stating that it was too simple and not sufficient to be a choreographic work. Uh, and so while dance is copyrightable, it's just a slightly higher standard uh, than just your basic moves. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, continuing on the TikTok discussion, kind of copyright a bit of dance moves, just the same. TikTok also has, in, in addition to promoting or bringing certain dances to the public uh, or the forefront of public attention, it's also with those dance moves also comes um, sound bites and kind of certain sound, sound, sound clips associated with those dances. And sound clips are certainly copyrightable. A few examples of those are the NBC Chime, MGM's iconic Roaring Lion uh, and Homer Simpson's Doe. And so, um, yeah, copyright is, uh, the, the sound clips are copyrightable so long as they're unique. And so, um, and that also exists, it extends to sound recordings as well. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the Communications Decency Act. So this, uh, this next set of slides relates to kind of um, actually specifically more Twitter um, as relates to um, granting um, internet service providers immunity for um, from liability for content posted by their users. And this is specifically specifically related to kind of um, defamation, uh, those types of, law, uh, of liabilities. Um, and the important thing is that um, the provider cannot be a publisher, meaning that they can't be an editor, they're not cur curtailing or they're not curating the content in any way, um, and they're just posting. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and so social media platforms and the C CDA. Uh, and so like I just mentioned earlier, the important thing is that the defendant isn't, uh, that is a, a computer services provider. They do not provide information content. And um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. And so an example of liability here is in the Housing Council of uh, San Fernando Valley, the roommates.com. Uh, and so roommates.com is a website that um, posts, um, or, or posts basically where you post an ad or, or a post seeking roommates. And um, the issue with roommates.com was that it allowed people to, or it sought information from users that were that violated um, the Fair Housing Act, where it asked for preferences on gender, sexual orientation, and family status. And so be, the court found that because roommates.com um, comes platform had pre kind of uh, filled in drop down menus associated with this, these kind of illegal um, or unlawful um, disclosures of information, uh, the court found that um, roommates.com was a kind of information publisher and was held uh, liable. Um, uh, on the other side of the um, bookend, we have Facebook, where Facebook uses algorithms designed to kind of curate content based on a user's preferences. Uh, and so while we can one can argue that Facebook does curate the content in some way, it's actually you know, not done in an active manner, I would, I would say. It's done through algorithms and that's kind of related to the user's own preference. So I think that's why it avoids liability in this context. Uh, next slide, please. And so social media censorship uh, within in, in recent years, um, I think everybody's know that, you know, President Trump was re recently banned from Twitter and also subsequently permanently banned from Twitter. Uh, and that's very interesting because, you know, some would argue that it is uh, Twitter violating Section 230. I think President Trump, uh, former President Trump, my apologies, um, tried to, re it was clamoring on removing the 230 protection from Twitter for that very reason. Um, and the, the discussion over censorship is actually a very interesting one uh, because uh, while on one side we have Republicans uh, uh, seeking uh, less censorship or less 
uh, controlled by the platforms. Uh, we have Democrats on the other side or the other party on the other side seeking more control or more, um, I would maybe not calling it censorship, but more control over what content is kind of left on there and not stating that a lot of this content promotes disinformation and um, uh, you know, violence and other negative um, uh, impacts. Uh, and that, that sums, sums up my, my presentation. Ryan. Okay, thanks, Dat. And uh, like Dat said there, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some um, interesting issues regarding the whole content ID that Dat mentioned. So just by way of review, um, their YouTube, what they do when, when you upload or stream content is they assign an ID to anything that is copyrighted. And then they, they use that ID to tag any content that they find contains that material. So as you can imagine, this could be subject to abuse. Um, what platforms and content owners are doing is becoming very aggressive about removal of material that has been designated as copyrightable. So it, what you see here is an example of Instagram's content report form. And it, literally anybody can go on Instagram and click a button, fill out a form. In this example, there's a number of different ways you can tag information, but the one we're talking about here is copyright. So you just click the copyright button, and then from there, it just takes you to the rest of the form. Okay, so this is how Google, like uh, Dat said, the, um, the content ID, what Google does is they even apply this in a live streaming context. So this is from Google's own terms of use. All live, live streams are scanned for matches to third-party content. Of course, they do that with that content ID, and that includes copyrighted content in the form of another live broadcast. So I'm going to um, talk about and show you an example of how this can be abused. Um, in this instance, and this one hits pretty clo close to home for all of us, this is the Beverly Hills Police Department. Um, this is an officer and he is playing a, a copyrighted video so that it cannot be live streamed. And so what he's doing is he tr he's trying to take advantage of the content ID, it will, the video will automatically get tagged and won't be able to be shown. Uh, where this came up is there's an Instagram user called Mr. Checkpoint, and this is a picture of him. He also has another Instagram account for his personal use called Senate TD. Um, what was happening in that video was that um, the officer was playing the, uh, the song Santeria from Sublime which is obviously copyrighted. And uh, he did that for the purpose we believe and everybody believes, you can even see Mr. Checkpoint believes that he's trying to use copyrighted music to quote, keep me from being able to play these videos on social media. So this is a way that, um, this is a way that that content ID policy in YouTube's automatic flagging is being abused right here in our own backyard. Um, another way that this is causing problems is uh, Rick Beato has talked about this. It's just being unable to make simple fair use of content. Uh, Rick Beato, if you know and are interested in music, is a popular YouTuber who talks a lot about music production, music theory, and various um, topics related to music. And that necessarily requires some playing of, of music. And a lot of times he does actual playing himself with a guitar or a piano. And other times he'll, he'll bring in others to, to play or he'll play short clips of the actual content. So he actually testified before the Senate last year in July about the problem of him not being able to, to teach and share content. Um, he is, uh, of his 750 YouTube videos, 254 were demonetized and 43 were taken down. And what he believes that is due to is content farms. And this is a, a large group of people who are 
essentially hired by the content creators to tag videos online so that they will be blocked and or monetized. And he, uh, as a result, has, like I said, been unable to, to, to share music theory and, and actually teach. He has proposed to Congress a fair use registry. It's kind of like a blue check, if you're familiar with Twitter or Instagram, for certified fair users. And if, you, if, if one would consider the amount of copyrighted content and whether it harms the copyright holder's ability to profit from the work, then none of his videos would be taken down. So going back to this instance with the police officer, um, this is clearly fair use. The, the content is clearly not going to supplant the sublime Santeria. Nobody's gonna listen to this instead of watching or listening to, to that content. But nonetheless, this type of content is getting blocked. And so there's no real analysis being performed by these tech companies of fair use. Now there is a process to try to do that analysis and appeal the blocks, but by that point, you've gone through several days or weeks and a lot of um, hassle to get that reviewed appropriately. So this is a big problem with, with social media and just this automatic blocking of content. Um, there's a question, how does YouTube know what is copyrighted as it, at, as it is uploaded? Um, I believe that content creators such as um, movie or music copyright owners will provide a list and will pr provide all of the content that they've asserted is copyrighted. And then YouTube will assign a content ID to all of that material and then compare it to materials that are being uploaded. Uh, and then it's automatically scanned um, using algorithms to identify similarities to those designated materials. The next topic I'm gonna address is who owns content that is uploaded to Instagram. So for example, this content that we see here, who actually owns that, the, the, the video that was filmed? Is it Instagram, is it, um, or is it Mr. Checkpoint? The terms of use for Instagram state that the users grant Facebook a non-exclusive, royalty-free, transferable, sub-licensable sub worldwide license to host, use, distribute, etc. So essentially, the, the user still owns the actual content, but has granted a pretty extensive license to Facebook, meaning they can essentially do whatever they want with it um, as long as it's um, falling within certain um, of these categories. So here's a case where, where this sort of, or this issue sort of arose. Uh, Gigi Hadid is a Instagrammer and model who posted a picture to her Instagram account. You can see that she has 43 million followers. She's a celebrity and she gets followed around by paparazzi. Uh, for some reason on this, on this occasion, she saw the paparazzi, she posed, she smiled, and then the paparazzi took a picture. Uh, they then posted that somewhere online. She liked the picture and then she put it on her Instagram account. And then of course the paparazzi or the copyright owner of that content sued and asked her for damages and to remove the content. And you can see their allegation there, paragraph 21, Exclusive, who was the, the content owner uh, that the paparazzi had assigned the content, uh, the copyright to, is informed and believes Hadid without permission or consent of exclusive copied and used the copyrighted photograph on her Instagram account. And they contended that that violates their exclusive rights to reproduction and distribution. In defense, uh, Hadid argued or his, her lawyers argued that there was fair use and also that there was an implied license. They argued that it was not commercial exploitation by her. She wasn't making money on that post. It was a quick shot in a public setting. Um, a street photograph is factual work that has less copyrightability under the fair use factors that Hadid posed and thus contributed to the work, which is an interesting argument, and that she had cropped out 50% of the image and didn't use the whole thing. 
She also argued that there was an implied license because, again, that she had posed and the paparazzi elected to take the photograph and it was made more valuable through her participation. So unfortunately, the court did not get to the merits of any of those issues. Um, they dismissed the case because the plaintiff had failed to obtain a copyright registration. Instead, they had only submitted a registration. And this reflects a recent Supreme Court ruling that in order to proceed with copyright infringement in courts, you need to actually have received the registration and not just have uh, filed for the registration. So you can see the fourth estate case from the Supreme Court in 2019, that was the holding in that case. So yeah, the court did not rule on the fair use or implied license defenses. Uh, the next case I'm gonna discuss is embedding content. And this, what this means is taking social media content and using it, embedding it in other platforms. So here we have an Instagram account. Uh, Elliot McGuckin is a photographer and physicist who lives here in Los Angeles. And he took this interesting photograph of a, a lake in Death Valley, uh, which doesn't happen very often. It doesn't rain really that much. And when it does, it doesn't, the, the water doesn't stick around for very long. So this was a very interesting, valuable photograph and Newsweek had used it in an article. They um, wanted to talk about this phenomenon and they, they essentially took his entire Instagram uh, post. So they included his name and they included the picture. They probably felt or were advised that that was enough. Um, here's the example, um, a little bit bigger. But the photographer sued. And he argued copyright infringement, even though they had embedded his, his Instagram ID to show that they didn't take the picture, he still felt that that was infringement. So the question there was whether there is a license that was uh, granted to Newsweek by virtue of the fact that McGuckin had uploaded this content onto Instagram. And this is a very interesting question. It, has only recently begun to be addressed by the courts. The court, and this was in, in New York, by the way, the district court ruled on Newsweek's motion to dismiss and denied it because, uh, well, first of all, Newsweek had argued in their motion that they had a valid sublicense under Instagram's terms of use and that their publication constituted fair use. The court denied that because there was no evidence that YouTube um, excuse me, Instagram had actually granted a license to uh, Newsweek. And also that Newsweek was not making fair use. And here's the analysis um, of the fair use factors that the court went through. The purpose and character of the use, they admitted that the use was commercial, um, that they were providing ads and selling content on subscription. They admitted that the article itself was not about the photograph, it was about the phenomenon and therefore it was not transformative. Um, and they argued that the photo was illustrative of the phenomenon of a 10 mile lake in Death Valley. Uh, the na nature of the work, it was neutral, the court said, although the court did admit that it was fine art landscaping, uh, which would go towards um, greater copyright protection. With regard to the amount and sustainability, that was neutral and the effect of the use favors plaintiff because there's a presumption of market harm when a commercial use amounts to mere duplication of the entirety of the original. So uh, what happened? Newsweek relented, they dropped the photograph and they put this um, pretty pathetic picture of Salt Creek in Death Valley from two years earlier that is not at all as impressive as the photograph. So apparently McGuckin had the only real photograph of that phenomenon and was able to uh, presumably get some compensation for that. So best practices when it comes to um, copyrightability on social media, get permission to use or embed content, register often and early, um, and consider this the new short online literary works registration process, which Jarissa is going to speak about next. So turning it over to Darissa. All right, thank you so much, Ryan, uh, for great presentation. So um, 
I uh, want to talk a little bit about social media influencers and um, in context of, uh, you know, as, as we've seen over the past uh, years or so, uh, they have, if you can click on that, <laughs> another click, please. Okay, thank you. That um, they've actually been very prominent and there's a, a lot of, and in, in, in one area that's, um, that's concerning is uh, counterfeit products. Um, so there was a relatively recent case and you can check the case number here where um, Amazon actually sued some of these social media influencers uh, for their participation in online scam to sell a lot of uh, counterfeit luxury goods. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So the way it would happen is, you know, you would go on the Instagram site and you slide, you, and then it would, next slide, please. Then it would take you to the link and that's where the knockoff instead of, instead of the actual high quality product would be sold. Uh, next, please. So essentially Amazon made allegations that, you know, for, uh, false designation of origin, false advertising, and Washington's consumer protection law. Um, so they wanted to shut down uh, basically the the purported uh, scheme. Next slide, please. And this is basically investigation showed um, the knockoff products. Next one, please. Next slide. So um, it would make sense as Amazon has been under scrutiny in the past uh, the, as among 72 uh, physical market online and physical marketplaces, uh, which has harbored a lot of counterfeit and pirated uh, goods that, according to U.S. trade representative, uh, caused significant harm to the U.S. economy. Uh, next slide, please. Another click. <laughs> so uh, basically uh, what we know is that this is a huge problem that brands need to, um, that they simply can't ignore. Um, in fact, over a quarter of US consumers have been fooled into buying fake goods over the past 12 months and um, about 56,000 plus accounts uh, that promote counterfeits were discovered in Instagram in 2019, which is more than 171% compared to prior three years before. Uh, next slide. So um, the problem is there has been some cases, of course, where influencers knowingly promoted a lot of these counterfeit goods, but the issue is that we have a lot of many online personalities that they just simply don't verify the products. And that can lead to a lot of um, impacts, not only in terms of infringement and counterfeit goods, uh, but also in terms of potential harm that it could have, uh, especially when we're talking about, uh, next click, please. Let me click. Um, so in 2019, BBC investigation showed three um, influencers who were asked to promote a fake diet drink, which had cyanide, as you know, that's a rather <laughs> toxic chemical. And they agreed without verifying or understanding any of the impact that the ingredients um, and the dangers that it would pose. Um, so as you can see, next slide, please. You know, the problem is uh, mainly in the realm of not verifying a lot of these products. Um, there was also, uh, in 2018, we had influencers like M Cupcake, K-Cup, uh, that were revealed to promote a lot of websites that had counterfeit products like watches and their combined base followers were over 1 million consumers. Next one, please. So again, uh, this, is, this is about selling a lot of dangerous products, not just counterfeit goods, but a harmful impacts that these products would have uh, if, if not due diligence is exercised and these influencers don't really check and verify these products. Next slide, please. Um, now, a lot of, of course, if you do a quick search on Instagram or Facebook, 
uh, you're going to see a lot of luxury goods um, with fake products or sales. Um, and 45% of the world's population is now active on social media. So this is going to pose a greater risk than ever to consumers and brands. Uh, next slide, please. Especially in context of uh, cosmetics, we can see that a lot happening. So a lot of cosmetic products actually uh, could cause harmful in, in terms of um, supplements, vitamins, um, drinks, and things like that. So again, the gravity of the harm is so much more than just um, infringing products that would be uh, infringing on other the brands, but also the impact on consumers. Uh, the next area that I wanted to uh, talk about relates to copyright and social media influencers taking advantage of the, the new law, which uh, actually August 17 of 2020, um, Copyright Office amended its regulations. So now we have a new group registration option for short online literary works. So that basically helps a lot of online content creators like bloggers and social media influencers to be able to use um, this new group registration for their online works. And this covers works such as, can, next one please, um, blog entries, emails, uh, social media posts, short online wor works, I'm sorry, not emails, but um, short online works. So the copyright actually, email wouldn't be covered. Um, so the Copyright Office had this new group registration. As you can see, a lot of uh, you know, influencers might have short blogs and it's, it, there's a lot of content on daily basis that they produce. So if they were to register for each of these, it would be very time consuming and costly and laborious. So um, this could potentially help them in terms of group registration so then now they can create, they can protect their work more so than before. Next slide, please. So in order to qualify, um, you can register up to 50 short online works per application. And the qualification that the work has to have at least 50, but no more than 17,500 words. And it must be by the same individual or jointly by the same individuals, uh, creators being named as claimants of each work. And the works should be published within the three month calendar period uh, from the registration. So um, next one, please. So um, to, once you get to register this, of course, then uh, you get protection for each of them as separate authorship works. So arguably that's good news for influencers because in the past, like I said, a lot of them were you know, not able to uh, protect a lot of their work because of the labor intensiveness of, you know, because of high volume amount of work that they had. And they had a lot of costs that each one would have to uh, be registered individually. Um, that would prohibit a lot of them from actually protecting their work uh, to the extent uh, that they would get um, to the extent of statutory damages and, you know, general copyright uh, outside the common law protection. Um, next one, please. So, um, next one, please. So yeah, basically, um, this allows for them to take advantage of this, uh, short post that now they could, uh, group register together. But if we go to the next slide, please, um, we'll see that there are certain things that are not covered that are not covered under this new law. And notably, the rule doesn't apply to work made for hire, um, emails, and podcasts for audiobooks, uh, video blogs. So, next one, please. Thank you. Next slide. So, the downside is well, a lot of these influencers might have other elements. Um, you know, the bloggers might combine textual uh, commentary with photographs, videos, music. Um, so in order for them to be able to uh, get protection for their multimedia posts, then they need to have 
come all these then they had to vote individually and protect separate submit separate applications for each post so that's sort of counter to the purpose of this law in a way because now you know you you still have to go and um, and a lot of the work actually does have a lot of these other elements next slide please so another down side is also, especially with retailers, or a lot of times retailers would, um, especially if they have some sort of uh, leverage, they would require the influencers to grant all the rights to their company. Now the problem is uh, work for hire doesn't, is one of the exceptions, right? It doesn't cover, it's not protected and can't take advantage of this group registration. Um, so what happens, next one please. So um, basically, you know, a lot of times you have an agreement, work for hire, an influencer agreement. Uh, so the, the author is going to be uh, the employer, the retailer, which would not be able to take advantage of this law. Next slide, please. But um, so what, what can happen, again, that's a downside. Um, next slide, yes. Um, so what can happen is that, you know, sometimes in their influencer agreements, um, they assign, the influencers assign all their rights to the retailer, and then the retailer is left with a bunch of work that's, you know, they would have to individually go ahead and copyright, and that doesn't really help, uh, or they just have to forfeit, you know, having protection uh, for these work under, you know, the terms of copyright uh, statutory protection. So another uh, potential recommendation, we go to the next slide, would be, uh, next one, uh, that the retailer might be able to have in their agreement that make the blogger basically go ahead as long as it qualifies and is within this time frame of the law that applies to them, go ahead and require them to apply for registration and then assign their rights once they actually uh, following registration, then they can assign their rights to those posts to the retailer. So that might be a potential way to um, still be able to get uh, and take advantage of the law. So that's pretty much it on my end. Um, and anybody has any questions or we, we can probably have a few more minutes for questions. Looks like uh, Patrick Gorman, and it's one o'clock, so folks, if you guys need to drop off, feel free. Um, Patrick Gorman had one question. What about retweeting or otherwise reposting someone else's post, even for a commercial purpose? Um, Dat, do you want to address that, or, or would you like me to? Okay. <laughs> so I think it's a bad idea um, to repost. Obviously, retweeting is something that's allowed because um, that's, that's a... A Twitter functionality that's built in. So I would say um, reposting like in the sense of embedding content that from Instagram into another platform would be a form of copying that content and could subject the, the user to copyright claims. But I don't believe retweeting would be an issue. I, I will also add if we're talking about um, commercial content and advertising, um, sometimes that has been held if you are reposting, retweeting it, and that can be held as kind of an, your own endorsement of the product. So if those plans can contain also all statements, it could be uh, held against you as well. Okay, well, thanks everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone. And again, the uh, material should be emailed to you within 24 hours for MCLE certificate. And the material should have been emailed to you. And there was a link for all the uh, slides that we covered today. Uh, so feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you, everyone.